Welcome. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I was just saying that I'm going to really have to thank Brian and Sue for putting me at the uh, Friday afternoon session right after lunch. That's just fantastic, <laughs> optimal time for learning, I'm sure. So as a matter, I was uh, I was in the uh, the women's restroom earlier today, sitting at the sink and washing my hands, and someone's like, "Oh, I am so done with workshops," and I'm like. Oh no, oh no, I'm, I'm sunk this afternoon, I'm sunk. So um, I am going to try and get you guys up moving around a little bit and give you some time to process and have conversations because I think that's when the real learning occurs. Um, so first thing to know is that, um, oops, I guess I should use my clicker. Um, I have, oh, and it's not working. That's always fun. It was working a second ago. This is exactly the way technology works, right? <clears throat> you try it, everything works fine. I'm an assistive technology consultant. It is, I think, maybe not. Yeah, yep, it was. Okay, let's try it again. I think it just lost its connection. No, it's just not going to work. Okay, we'll do it the old fashioned way. So, um, my name is Corinne Hauer. I'm an assistive technology consultant in, uh, for an ISD in Michigan. I'll tell you a little bit about, more about that in a second. Um, my background is an occupational therapist and um, like the real, the whole thing is frozen. There we go. So first thing you should know about this is that I've totally, I've changed the name of the presentation. So just to keep you on your, oh, do you have one that you think would work? Look at you, you guys are problem solvers. Oh, amazing. I would like you to travel with me always. Let's try this. And um, so I have uh, changed the, you know, they ask you to submit these presentations months in advance, right? You like, you submit your proposal months in advance and you're like, okay, yeah. And I've never, like marketing has never been on my radar because I'm not good at catchy slogans and titles and uh, that's just, it's just not my thing. So, you know, so I'm like, oh yeah, out of the box, it's kind of like a different, like not, you know, not a structured approach to, and then I start writing my uh, conference proceedings a couple of, um, uh, you know, a month or so ago and I start thinking like, oh, that title is terrible. Like, what do I? It's kind of like you know, you go to the hospital to have a baby, and you have all these girl names picked out, and you get there, and it's like it's a boy. I'm like, oh, okay. So, anyways, just think about this too. An alternative title, if you will, would be getting personal with UDL, more personalized approach to teacher development. So, um, but enough about that. This one works. Thank you. And um, about me, I told you, educational therapist for 15 years. I've been in an educational setting for about 13. Assistive technology consultant for nine. So more personal things. I'm a wife and a mom. I've got three girls. Um, so I never got to the hospital and they said, it's a boy. Never happened for me. And uh, I get lots of sympathy for that all the time. So I uh, love all that stuff. Um, superpower, I always say, is seeing the strengths of students with the most significant challenges. And I'm a UDL instigator and implementer for about the past three years. So um, today, what I'm going to do, I'll tell you a little bit about our story. So a little bit of storytelling, a little narrative. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about um, some research that we looked into before we started our UDL journey in terms of not just the research behind UDL, because we looked at that too, it's the learning, learning around that, but specifically research around teacher development. And how do we fuse these? We know these, once we got some people to buy in at our ISD level about UDL, now how do we go about this in a way that we think we can really impact teachers in our county? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And so for those of you who like a little storytelling, we'll do that. For those of you who want some little tips and research, we'll do that. At the end, it's kind of like the cliff note. So if you just want to sit and sleep for a while and have your neighbor nudge you at the end, we'll kind of do a big idea recap. So just so you know. But um, so I'm from, I can do the Michigan thing. You know, I'm from here in Michigan on the coast of Lake Michigan. Um, we have about eight, 16 to 18 school districts within our county. So we're an intermediary between the state level and the local district level, which means we're middle management, right? We have responsibilities and no authority, essentially. So we, I'm um, part of a team of consultants charged with providing professional development and some services to districts in our county. And we have a lot of variability within our districts. Um, our economy relies heavily on manufacturing, so you can imagine what that's probably like. Well, they call us sometimes the little Detroit, so things that happen in Detroit happen to have a ripple effect on the opposite side of the state in Muskegon because we have a large uh, auto economy kind of a base there. Um, we have a uh, median household income, a little bit less than national average, poverty rate, 16.8%, a little bit higher than the national average. 
60% free and reduced lunch across our county. We do have some schools that are functioning about 100% free and reduced lunch, so we have discrepancy within the, the county. But um, 30,000 students enrolled K through 12, that doesn't include our early childhood and birth to three programs. So K through 12, 30,000 students enrolled in all those districts across our county. So just to give you um, a little, little picture, a little background. So I'm gonna start with, um, I got a little too close there. I'm gonna start with this narrative of our implementation and how we went about this. And so as we started to explore, um, give you a, I wanna give you a, just a little bit of advice. So I'm gonna start, first of all, give you guys an opportunity to talk to each other. So raise of hands because this is kind of like, you know, we've talked about this or you might have heard this in other sessions, that idea of starting a movement and being the lone nut, right? Like the first fish out of the bowl. So how many people in here would consider yourself the lone nut in this work? Raise of hands. Or at, or at some point have been the lone nut in this work. So, all right. How many people would consider yourselves to be like, Ah, uh, I'm trying to get brought along on this, but I'm still skeptical. I have some questions. Anybody that's in that, in that, still have some, still some, which is really good, really important. So what I'd like you to do is, if you're a person who is uh, the lone, you know, the lone nut, you're kind of trying to get this movement started. You're trying to grow this. Um, I want you to talk to somebody else who's the lone nut, I'm trying to get together in a group of maybe three to four people really quickly. I want you to talk about what was that tipping point? What was the tipping point that made you leap out of that bowl and go, yup, this is what I think that we need to do. This is the direction I need to go. And for those of you who are still swimming in the pond with the other fish and not quite sure, I want you to find somebody else who's in that pond with you and, and, and say, what's your burning question still? What is it that you need to have answered what do you need to have figured out? What are your concerns that are keeping you from following that, that movement? So just take a couple of minutes, find another person, so uh, in your same <laughs> position. Okay. You're swimming. I present at ATIA. I don't think I've done ATIA. No, I did not. I've been to ATIA. Okay, probably I might have seen you. I might have been in a session with you. But yeah. Okay. If you could take about 10 seconds to finish up your thought. Okay. Awesome. All right. So let's just have a couple people share out because I'm always curious. I think sometimes the best way to uh, get people on board is to really ask some important and tough questions. So let's start with the lone nuts. <laughs> if you're not opposed to uh, identifying yourself as that, somebody share something that they heard that was really a tipping point, something, an event, a piece of information, an experience. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going from um, changing from uh, disability, from a model of looking at the disability to looking at learner variability and going from a strengths-based model. So from deficits, how do we support student deficits to how do we maximize student strengths? Cool. Okay. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I will do that. All right. Other people who had um, that tipping that tipping point as a lone knot, what made you jump out of that? Anything different? Okay. What about, this is I think the more important questions, burning questions you still have, things that are keeping you back from being that first follower. Anybody brave enough to volunteer? Something you heard, doesn't have to be your idea, but maybe something you heard. Nobody? Nobody? All right, the, the court, initiative overload, right? Like one more thing, how to make it. Yes. So for you, something that you hope will be a tipping point is moving away from this idea of UDL as something to support maybe struggling students to something that can enhance learning for all students. So that might be something that helps push people. Okay, great. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my lone nut experience. It started at um, ATIA about three and a half years ago now. And I was in, I had the uh, good fortune to go to that conference, and for those who aren't familiar, it's an assistive technology conference. And I was in a two-day session with, um, facilitated by Denise DeCoste and, and Gail Bowser, and it was about redesigning the assistive technology team, which I'm a part of in my county. And I was really struggling, like, here I'm, I always felt like some like aftermarket salesman, right? Like, oh, I have something that can make this better for you. Then, you know, and it, again, that all that pushback is, yeah, 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 or yeah, that's nice for that kid. Yeah, can you set it up for that kid? Great, thanks, so I can keep doing my teaching. And um, I really wanted to figure out how to infuse some of the tools and support. So that's kind of the very narrow model of UDL or idea of UDL I started with. But I came back, so I went, was totally enthused after that, after that conference and hearing all these great things and had a conversation with, with Denise there, had lots of conversations with her, and um, she said, you know, hey, we have this conference, this UDL IRN coming up, you should come. I'm like, no, yeah, 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 come. I'm like, okay, so now I'm super enthusiastic. And um, I had happened to have, we had our annual, um, I'm a consultant in the special education side of our ISD, and we also have our instructional services, which is our general education side. And I mean, we are in the same building, but literally that's kind of how we used to function. And uh, right after that ATIA conference, I, um, the Monday we came back, we happened to have our annual, yes, annual, one time per year, joint department meeting. Ooh, right? And that's serious. Now, it, this changed significantly. We now meet two times a month, and we're doing lots of, we have lots of integrated efforts. So that's been big. But, I, so I'm emailing, you know, I'm, ta I'm talking to my administrator, special ed administrator and the, and the director of instructional services and saying, hey, at that meeting, we always do a little learning chunk. It was like in the annual meeting was we're all going to come, learn about something together, and then we're going to our own sandboxes in the same room, but we're at least we're in the same room, right? So um, I said, can I, can I talk about universal design for learning? And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, okay, come on. So I kind of went in a little something like this right? I was like, yes, I am going to change the world with this, right? I kind of felt a little bit like a, a, like a combination between, um, you know, an infomercial and uh, evangelist, you know, like I'm waiting for people to like cry and faint and cheer and yes, this is what we've been waiting for. And um, the response I got was probably something a little more like this. <laughs> like, um, okay, yep, like that's, that's, cool, you know, nice to know. And it wasn't that the people 
in the room didn't see the value in it, didn't think it was, had potential to be a good thing. They just didn't see how it had value to them. They just didn't see how it was important for them to know at that time, yo, you want to do that UDL stuff? Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. Do your thing. I'm going to be over here doing ELA and social studies and math, but you go, ahead, go right ahead and let me know how that goes, you know, like it, that kind of thing. So um, I had forgotten a really important piece of advice, which I continue to hear over and over and over at these sessions, and that was I needed to find my first follower. So as I was in that room, I reflected, you know, like kind of deflating experience, like, oh my gosh, nobody fainted, nobody cried, there's no applause at the end of this person, you know, like, what happened? And so I re was looking, and there were some people around the room nodding, kind of like, huh, like skeptically interested. And so I went, okay, those are the people I need to talk to next. And as I, ha I had two thoughts as I started talking to these people. One, I need somebody from Gen Ed on this because I can't make this a special ed thing. That's, that's going to die in the water if I approach it that way. Two, I need somebody to learn from outside experts a little bit at camp. It's got to be bigger than a conversation with me. And this UDL IRN thing is coming up. And I could share my room. So, you know, male consultants are out. Sorry. So I'm looking now for the gen ed female consultants that I can share a room with and invite to a, the UDL higher end. And so I, um, a little advice about the first follower. I wanted to choose someone with enthusiasm, right? Okay, nobody was looking at like this at the end of my like 90 minute spiel at our annual joint meeting, okay? So enthusiasm or has the potential to develop enthusiasm for the work? So um, somebody who's willing to learn alongside you and that's something I'll keep saying over and over is that being the lead learner versus the lead facilitator. So learning alongside someone, asking really important questions and having tough conversations and someone who could see connection to their work and invite them to you to your LRN. So that, um, that is exactly what I did. So I looked in our, um, one of our school improvement consultants, our MTSS consultants was like, huh, yeah, this is interesting. I said, hey, why don't you come to the IRN with me? Share a room, it's cool, it's, you know. So we, um, she did, and we had a great experience, and um, we decided to start to team up. So you'll see it, pictures, random pictures of my family, and as I put them in there, I'm like, gosh, we are dressed in costumes a lot. It's really weird, so I'm sorry. I guess it's our thing now. Uh, my daughter and my niece there, but um, so, which is half Halloween, but it could happen to be any Tuesday, too. This is just regular attire for them. But um, so what it, um, what we did is we decided, first of all, it had to be a joint thing, gen ed, special ed. We needed to make a plan, and we made that plan on the trip, on the plane back from the first um, IRON conference that we attended, uh, would have been three years ago now. And we decided that there needed to be some co-planning and facilitating of this learning. So um, when we decided, talked about the learning and now when I'm talking about the adult learning I'm talking about learning for our consultants and administrators at our ISD we haven't even touched the school level yet we're talking about how do we get people at our ISD to buy in so this isn't some isolated little pocket of one person or two people within a department trying to infuse into other things how do we kind of spread this more organically maybe so one thing we decided is we couldn't stand up there and preach to these these are people who are really smart. They're really bright. They're experts in their field. They do professional learning all the time. So we couldn't stand there and tell them how we think they should use it. We had to provide opportunities for them to make connections on their own. So again, that lead learner versus that lead facilitator type of thing. And we had to invite feedback, even if it was the mean tweet kind of feedback, right? Because we had to engage the margins. We had to figure out what was it. We had to ask those questions about what were their burning questions or concerns? Why wasn't this going to work in order to, to try and address those concerns? We couldn't just be like, okay, well, they're not, you know, we're not partying with them. We had to figure out a way to, to at least um, consider their perspectives. So we, uh, we did that. This is um, what we happened to. So we went from like, this, the result was we got to grow our team, right? So we had these, um, we asked our administration, first of all, can we engage in learning? Like that 90 minute session, like, yeah, that was, I kind of 
I bombed that, right? We, we want another go at this. We want to try this again. We really think this can work. Can we engage in some learning throughout the year? So then all of a sudden we went from meeting once a year for learning, it, we met four times that year, which was like historic shifts, like, right? So we went four times, 90 minutes, you get four times throughout the year, 90 minutes with everybody to engage them in learning. And I thought, this is our shot. So we did lots of, we had lots of dialogue, small group dialogue and conversation. We had little learning stations. This is for our ISD consultants still. You know, we let them explore and engage and have dialogue and answer and ask tough questions of us. And we, the result was we grew our team. So from that learning after the end of that year, the UDL leadership team emerged and that was, these were all the people who said, yeah, I want to partner in this work. I want to figure out how to make this work for schools because I think this is really important for kids. So we had a science consultant, our school improvement, MTSS, transition specialist, ASD or uh, autism consultant, special education curriculum consultant, social studies and special projects, me, assistive technology, behavior consultant, and special ed leadership. So I knew from the beginning, as an assistive technology consultant, if I went into this UDL thing, A, it was going to be all about tools, B, it was going to be all about special ed, and it was going to be very narrow and have probably little lasting impact. But now, now we've got a team, right? So now we're ready for this implementation, this kind of phase two scaling up. We've done our exploration. We've got a, big, a great core group of people to buy into this and say, yeah, we want to be. So now it's about what, how are we going to go about this? What is this going to look like? And I remember one of the consultants who was initially with the project and then got um, a promotion to a director and got assigned a big grant and wasn't able to participate as intimately. But sh one of her comments was, well, I don't think we should workshop this. And I was like, oh, you know, like a stab in the heart. Like, really? You don't think it's that? And I thought it was about the value. But through conversations, you know, I thought we learned a little bit more that um, there might be a different way that workshopping might narrow it too much and kind of pin down the butterfly, so to speak. And so how could we, how could we grow it more organically? So we take, took a look at our existing models of PD. We talked about what were the successes and what were the challenges? So we had countywide workshops. We had a small group PLC type of thing supporting that in the building. We have coaching. We have um, online blended learning. You name it. We've got lots of different models of PD. So we wanted to talk about what were the different models we had. What did we like about some of those? What did we not like? In specific to this the thought of UDL. And then we also looked at what is okay. What is, let's start out of the box too. Not, let's not just say we have to use one of these existing models that we use, but what else do we know about teacher development or what can we find out about teacher development that might help inform us? So what I want you to do right now is have a conversation. If you want to stand up and move around, that's great. If you just want to talk to the person next to you, I want you to have a conversation about this. Think about a professional learning experience. It could be formal or informal that you've been a part of that has it had impact for you across time, right? Not just like, oh, in that moment, that's, that's what I needed, but something that has informed and impacted your practice across time. I want you to talk about what were the, some of the characteristics of the content or the facilitation or delivery or the learning interactions of oppor or opportunities within that. So you don't have to name what it was. Go ahead and take a couple minutes, just talk to somebody.
they talk about student engagement, we ask them to tie it into UEL because they knew at that point that they understood the framework. But it was just very meaningful because all the teachers were like, you know, oh, it, it, it felt like they had somebody right there with them. It was coming from a colleague, it wasn't coming from us, the outsider bringing in the content. So I think it was, it was very meaningful in that sense. And it was something that we were, were like, you know, reflecting back on. I was like, you have to replicate that because it was, and it was, mm -hmm. I mean, as people come into the community, we practically did nothing but facilitate it. Yeah. We started with a one day overview just to employing the, the guidelines of UDL and, our, and the teachers that needed that. We gave them the UDL now book, Katie Novak, Circuit Submission. And then um, we realized it's not deep enough. So then we made it a two day. We got into the book in the, the first day. They had to learn some basics and the second day. They created some literacy trackers and some um, choice assignments. They uploaded them on the tablet so they felt really equipped and they were working with their standards, and which we loved. But then we realized we weren't getting student income uh, 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 data that we wanted. So again, every step is refined. So then we, we, we offered a books book talk, so they, we gave them, since we didn't get through the whole book, we gave them opportunities to get more of the book, and then we gave them a scaffolded approach, um, step by step, on how to upload that data into the um, student outcome data portal, and then, um, then that also then evolved into doing PLC at some schools, and so we're bringing district people along with us to do those PLCs, so now we're starting to that capacity piece in our schools. Where there's buy-in already, so it's it, it's sort of like a snowball. Continuing to shift and yeah. refine every, every step time of the way. We refine. We Yeah, sometimes you have to. Transforming a transforming the role of AT teams or something. I think it was. Yeah. Cool. All right. If you could take a minute to finish up your conversation, actually, let's take thirty seconds. How about that? And finish up your conversation. And this is the part where I tell the teachers, finish your sentence, not your paragraph, right? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So just really quickly, um, a couple people to share out something, a characteristic of the, the content or the, facilita the facilitation or delivery of that training or interactions opportunities that made it really impactful, just, just in a word or two, something that you can nail down that said, that where you say, this was what made it impactful for me. I love my counterpart saying that they used UDL to talk about UDL. So they, it was constantly being modeled while they were presenting what it was. Yeah, so modeling the strategies right within the training. Awesome. Anybody else? Yeah. It needs to be over time, but a little bit over time. And that's where I think the biggest change with things like this is that you have that constant context that we were preparing to where I was on this one team. We only need two or three times a year, and we've been meeting now for almost six years. And if there's progress, so it's just a slow where another project comes. Mm -hmm. So that uh, opportunity to continue to reflect and re refine and shift your practice. Yeah. What all of our kind of shares had in common in our group was that there was always a time for um, like participant or learner reflection mm -hmm. and that we 
felt like there was a lot of value in that reflection time in each, of, like kind of each of our models, even though they were a little bit different, but we felt like that was one of our very valuable pieces. Time for reflection, absolutely. Yes. Um, also, uh, real world um, examples um, and time to mm. kind of build off of that, not just for reflection, but for practice mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. the um, within the professional development. I want to take something that I'm learning and be able to use it on Monday and start mm -hmm. with respect. So having some real world examples, having the time to go back and actually something that you could go back and put right into practice or at least time to think about how you're going to apply it to your practice before you walk out the door for you. Yes. Yeah, and it's so funny that brain-based learning in adults, and you start to look at it and layer it on top of the UDL framework, and you're like, huh, you know, that's interesting. Like, brains are brains in some ways, right? Like, kids' brains and adults' brains, time for reflection. So here's what we found um, <laughs> in terms of current research on teacher development. And uh, there, this um, part of this, a lot, a lot of this was based on a meta-analysis from the new teacher project called the Mirage, and it's a report of some meta-analysis of lots of really trying to answer that age-old questions like what's the best way to impact change for teachers how what's the best way to impact teachers uh, practice actually in the classroom and, and affect student outcomes and it gave you um, the really the report was a little bit disheartening and it said eh, th there's no best model we cannot pinpoint a best model of professional development we looked at everything system-wide but bottom up, PLC, uh, job embedded coaching, uh, you know, other instructional coaching, um, instructional rounds, like they looked at all of these different models and they couldn't pinpoint one that made a difference. What they could do is look at all of those models and they could pull out characteristics, so ideal characteristics that a, a district uh, could implore, to, to, could put in place to support teacher growth. So rather than thinking of so about much about the model, it was about what were the things within that model you were doing? What are some of the, the conditions that you could imply? So, um, so we took three of those that we had the most control over. So some of them were about teacher um, incentivizing teachers. Now we did that as much as we could, but we also had no budget for this. We had money to pay them food when they came and stayed three hours after their work day to have a dinner and dialogue session. Other than that, we had no funds. There was no tools, no technology, nothing tied to this, no stipends. Um, so, but these are things that we thought we have control over and we can be really intentional about. So one was extending the reach of great teachers. We've heard that over and over. Start with your early innovators, right? Get some pockets of things going. And then two was reflection, which we heard a lot about. So support teachers in developing a clear and deep understanding of what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and um, invite feedback on effectiveness of learning. So none of you mentioned, when you're in there, none of you, uh, when we had that conversation, nobody mentioned, well, they told me exactly what to do, exactly what it was gonna look like, how to do it, when to do it, in my classroom. Like, that, that, that's just not practical. So. Um, now we were ready to, we kind of had our, our uh, non-negotiables for our model and we were ready to start to integrate. So here's how we integrated those concepts and along with the UDL principles, we looked at extending the reach of great teachers. So we had teachers in our counties, we started talking about this and we had that same concern of initiative overload and we cannot make this one more thing because teachers have enough on their plates. We can't make this one more thing. So we said, well, there are teachers who are doing this. They're not calling it UDL, but they're doing this. They embody that philosophy. They're using some of these principles and strategies. So how do we capitalize on those teachers? How do we bring them in, connect it to the things that they're already doing in their classroom, and maybe, maybe build about it, make it more intentional, make them more aware of the why what they're doing works. Um, so we started very small. We had 12 teachers from across our district. So we're talking some districts had a teacher. Some districts had two or at the most um, we had, do we have one district with three teachers? No, they start out with two. 
And so we had you know, a couple teachers. We had special ed teachers and gen ed teachers, and we also invited a couple of administrators. We were really intentional about inviting administrators who did not have teachers participating in the project because we didn't want it to be tied to an evaluative structure. We wanted those administrators to be able to go in and join some classroom observations and some coaching sessions, and we wanted it to be non-evaluative at this point. We were just looking for an opportunity for some teachers to try this on to see how it fit. Let, give them the chance to explore to see if it met a need for them. And so at the end of the year, we had invited those teachers to um, invite their first followers. Right? We recognize that strength, like, hey, okay, but they can't continue to be an island. So we asked them to invite them back the second year. That deep understanding of performance, that reflection piece we had, we talked about the dinner and dialogue sessions, those were largely based on time for small group discussion and dialogue. We did some teaching of, of the framework and what it looked like and a little bit of the research behind it and the why, but um, we started by connecting it with their strengths. So we said, identify what in here, what, what are you good at? When somebody comes into your room and you want them to be looking for something, say you want them to notice a strength of yours, what should they look for? Okay, where do you see that reflected in the framework? Do you see it reflected? And they always could identify, like, well, I'm really good at relationships. Okay, well, what is it about that? I make kids feel safe in my classroom. Everybody has a voice. I'm big on building community. Oh. So in this area of engagement, so bringing more awareness and intentionality behind the practices that they were already using and how they were connected to the framework. Okay, and then we asked them, so we used some online survey tools to, add, to support that reflection piece and then a goal setting piece. So okay, now looking at the framework, what are some areas that you think you could be more intentional about, that you think could shift your kids in the margins. We talked a lot about kids in the margins. What do you think you could shift? How, how could the framework shift kids in the margins if you could be more intentional about that piece? So we were really intentional, intentional about not giving people a place to start. We didn't do, okay, today we're gonna all learn about engagement and we're gonna talk about engagement and you're gonna go back and you're gonna pick an area of engagement that you're gonna do because for some people, we know we would have lost some teachers. There would have been teachers there who had said, my kids are engaged. I know about engagement. I've done champs, I've done whatever. I'm big on relationships. I, people come to me, I don't need to know more about that. If we had started from a model where we had gone step by step through the framework, we would have lost some of the teachers. We needed it to be personally, um, to, to, for it to be personalized for them and connect to their needs. Um, so we framed the goal settings using the margins, we talked about that, and provided really personalized observations and feedback, and, um, and we had coaching to support their reflection and goal setting. So between each dinner and dialogue session, oh, we talked about this, um, that was where I said we let them choose the areas of the framework, and we asked them to, to choose a primary and a secondary area, work on those, and allowed them to shift as they saw the need to shift um, in their practice. So we had self-reflection and goal setting surveys that looked at their current knowledge of the framework, intentional use of, during lesson design. We did pre and post surveys. Um, their students in the margins, what do they need? Um, what, what, are they, what areas of the framework do you think they could benefit from? Um, and then we asked them about specific checkpoints and strategies they thought might push their practice. And then we asked them, what do you want to see as a result of this? And then we did some post surveys and um, got some really good results. So, the, and then we had these coaching conversation, conversations. So I mentioned this during, in between each dinner and dialogue, you had an opportunity for someone from our UDL team, I meaning all that, that big team of all those consultants and administrators to come into your classroom, observe your practice for a reason that you selected. It was not for me to come in there and say, yeah, you are really good at engagement, but I think you could be a better teacher if you did this, because that does not go over well. <laughs> I'm, and that's not a position I would ever want to put myself in or a teacher in. So what we did is really reflected on their area of focus and asked them, so tell me how you were intentional about that. What things did you do, okay? How did you, what were the results you think because of that? Well, you know, it did go better than this lesson typically does because I did this. Okay, so tell me what, you know, and we kind of led them through. We had these, these 
scripted, um, not really scripted, but we had these questions, these scripted questions at least, to, to help l lead this conversation, and then ask them to choose their next area of focus. Some of them wanted to continue to work on this. So as an example, we have a, um, uh, a we found that you can, there's some concern sometimes about going this model and just picking an area or two to focus on because how do you reach the whole framework? What we found is by really coaching the thinking rather than those specific areas, ooh, check out this area of the framework, ooh, you might want to consider this, by coaching the thinking behind why they were doing what they're doing and where they needed to go next, they were able to explore a lot more of the framework more deeply. So an example would be a high school physics teacher who Probably if I would have started and said, I think your students need to be in smaller groups and you need to engage them in more dialogue, and you know, that, that probably in a high school environment wouldn't have gone over well. But we went in and we did an observation and said, so tell me about where do, you, where do you think you need to start for your students in the margins? I need to start with engagement. These kids are not connecting to this curriculum. Okay, what about, you know, what can you tell me about your student engagement? Tell me about your students in the margins. Um, how, do you, how do you build engagement? Well, you know, these are kids, I'm kind of trying this new curriculum, these are kids who are used to be being told what to do, all they have to do is read the chapter, spout out the answers, um, memorize some vocabulary, and check it off, and they're done. And I'm asking them to think more critically now, and it's a little scary for them. I said, oh, so you really need to think about how to maximize their their safety, kind of build collaboration and community. Yeah, they're afraid to look stupid in front of their peers, I think, they're, or in front of me. They're, these are high-flying kids. They're used to being the high achievers. Okay, so think about yourself as a learner. What helps you feel safe to kind of put yourself out there when you're not sure of something? Well, I have to talk it through with a colleague first, or I have to talk in a small group, or I have to have conversations. I'm like, oh, so what did that look like in your classroom? Well, I think I need to change these table groupings, and my kids have to have, they need to be in smaller groups, and they need to be able to have some dialogue and share some of their ideas in a safe space before they share it in front of the whole class. Oh, so we got to maybe in an area of the framework that we wouldn't have started in, but it was by identifying where she identified her students in the margins that by their needs, so. Okay, and the next piece is we gathered lots of feedback on um, professional development activities we were offering. So we didn't say like, okay, yep, we did it, good job, go back to your, at the end of every professional development session that we offered, so our dinner and dialogue sessions, we said, okay, what was most valuable tonight? What do you want more of? What, what additional resources do you need? Um, we asked that at the end of every coaching session. Our last question was, how has this conversation be, been helpful to you? And what do you need to help you move forward I mean, just something as simple and open-ended as that. And, and I think that's a piece that is largely ignored. We kind of give those like end of the PD evaluations, like at the end of the whole series, like tell me what you thought. And you figure you got like three and a half out of five stars. They're like, huh, okay, well, good to know for the next group. But guess what? Just like kids in a classroom, the next group is going to be different and they're going to need different things. And so being able to gather this feedback allowed us to be really dynamic and responsive to the teachers and, um, that were in front of us at the time. So there's some feedback questions. So talking about things that even down to the level of, of the activity. So we said, you know, that whole group learning, what did you think? Ah, it was okay. Small group dialogue, yes. I want more of the, small, small, the classroom observation and coaching, again, was another thing that was really high. It also helped us to know where we needed to spend more time during our dinner and dialogue sessions and our coaching conversation. So this is kind of what the project looked like over the first two years. Notice year three. This is, we've just finished year two, year three kind of blank because this is the part where we said we're going to lead you through this kind of exploration and then we're going to talk about inviting some more people and starting to build capacity. Year three, you're going back to a district that has a context that is unique to your building, your district. We can't tell you what that's going to look like. Right? You have to, but we'll help you build it. We'll help you uh, kind of frame what those conversations might look like in your building or in your district, but we can't, we can't design that in a way that's going to meet the needs of all of, your, all of your districts. And for those of you who, I've just added this one, if you downloaded the PowerPoint earlier this week, I've changed it and reloaded it, re-uploaded it today. So. Um, so we had some successes. So successes for our teachers, so they had, um, definitely reported growth in the knowledge of and understanding of the UDL guidelines and um, 
they were more intentional. I think this was the big, more intentional about incorporating those during their planning. We had students that are teachers who reported progress in student engagement, growth in the margins, increased ownership of learning, increased self-regulation. Here is the kind of unintended success is we had parallel learning of consultants and administrators. So the person who said, you know, the best learning is when I get to do it over time, that it doesn't, you know, I, we keep coming back to it and back to it and back to it. So we had done some kind of really cursory learning and conversations with our ISD consultants. Every consultant on our, who was on our leadership team came back and attended the dinner and dialogue and went into classrooms and had conversations, coaching conversations with participants. We learned just as much about that UDL and UDL implementation and thinking and designing and planning around UDL as the teacher participants did. So we continued to grow our capacity within the ISD for this uh, a really rich and deep understanding of UDL. Uh, that was just kind of an un unintended um, positive consequence of that, which has been great because that has shaped now teacher, now some of those um, consultants who are like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll come help you with this. I'll, I'm, I'm on board. I'll, it, you know, I'm still gonna just do my, I might integrate it into some of my other you know, content area related PD, and now they're coming back and saying, you know, I think I, I wanna do a series for high school science teachers. Like, I wanna talk about, I have a group of high school science teachers who are in this really traditional model. Do you know how many kids are pulled out for resource room um, services and for high school science? I go, yeah. No, it's like a lot. I'm like, yeah, it's really a lot. I think we can change that. I think we can UDL, use UDL to change that. So we had some parallel learning and it branched out um, beyond the, the project from that. Challenges, administrative buy-in, of course. You know, we technically left, we technically, we uh, purposely, I should say, left some of the administrators out of the conversation because we wanted to give teachers an out. We didn't want to get their administrators hyped up on board and have teachers come in and say, nah, not for me, and now all of a sudden they've got this administrator who's expecting them to do this, right? We wanted to give them try, a chance to try it out. So we've got, we're going back and we're looking at how to build administrator buy-in now. And um, so that's a lot of the lessons I've taken back from this conference. And student level data collection, our group was so diverse. We have so many different, we have K through 12, all content areas, multiple districts. Um, you're talking about the variability within those districts is extreme. And so we don't have that student level data. Our, a lot of it is teacher report. So how do you know this is working? My students are more engaged. Great, okay. So kind of that teacher report, but we don't have that specific student level data. So how do we get that? Um, relies on starting with highly effective, <laughs> reflective teachers. We started with our teacher leaders. We started with people who are already kind of embracing this. So when they go back and look at using this in their buildings, we're gonna have to help them think about that. Are they gonna start with teacher leaders? Are they gonna start with people who might be more new and how is that going to change the learning it can't be the same learning experience they had it's, we're going to have to to help them figure that out um, opportunities to see it in other classrooms was another barrier because our county is spread <laughs> and so for you know one uh, teacher in one district to see it in another district and we have a whole sub um, issue we can't get subs in our county and i don't know if that's countrywide or what but it's um it's a big issue so we're we're working around that and um, building co coaching capacity, so that's our next step. How do we build these, this coaching capacity within the teachers that were part of the project so they can go back and be coaches within their buildings? Um, and then the last big one is, so now we have teachers who we want to per allow them to personalize this to their context. So we have teachers who came, invited other people. They, now they've got you know, four people from their district and two administrators who have joined this year and now they're ready. They're ready to scale it up and they're ready to go. And we have other teachers who value the work and are, see it impacting their classroom and say, I can't think of another teacher and my administrator is not gonna jump on board with this and I can't think of another teacher in my district and I'm afraid I'm gonna lose the connection if I don't, if I can't continue to have conversations with people like this who think and plan like I do. So how do we meet the needs of all those groups? So, Here's where we're at now. So we have these district partnerships who are all over the place. And here's us, we're trying to scale. So we're in moving forward, we're trying to build this project so that we can support the margins of our county. So um, doing a kind of intro, dinner and dialogue. So the things on top, more 
facilitated, not exclusively, but more facilitated by ISD consultants, the thing on the bottom, the things along the bottom, more facilitated by those teachers who are part of the project. Um, so anything from introduction to UDL, so bringing new people on board to a UDL classroom scale up, so we're looking more at that individual classroom level and how to hone their practices and build confidence so that they can maybe reach out to other teachers in their building to um, a UDL in building PLC, like, okay, we've got a pocket of people, I think we can go with this in small pockets in our building, to we're ready to go building wide with this. We want all our teachers in our building to know and learn about this. So we're looking at, um, at that. The next couple of slides on there just talks a little bit, gives a little bit more in information about some of the activities that will happen um, as part of that. Okay, the other thing that we're doing now is as we're scaling, we're also at the county level, at the ISD, we are trying to, now again, this is one of those benefits of the parallel learning of the consultants who are were involved, is we're looking at how do we integrate this with countywide initiatives. Okay, so there's some districts who aren't going to go like, yeah, we're gonna do UDL, that's gonna be our thing, this is, how, this is gonna be the framework that really frames all of our learning um, initiatives. But we have curriculum directors who have, are saying, we need a countywide vision for high quality instruction. So we have these high quality visions for instruction, we have content experts who are there and all these people. And we said, well, what about if we fold UDL into that lens? We don't have to call it UDL, but can we be intentional about including UDL practices in that vision for student and teacher actions and what high quality instruction looks like when you walk into a room so across the county so we're starting to infiltrate some um, some other areas within the counties and again organically but um, which is really exciting okay so here's the highlight reel so if your person next to you is sleeping and they want the cliff notes this is the time to shake them up so if you're trying to start a movement it's important to have enthusiasm it's more important to nurture the enthusiasm in others. Be a lead learner along with them, not a facilitator. Help them to connect it to their work. Um, it's big work, don't go it alone. You, can't be, you can be the lone nut for a little while, you can't be the lone nut forever. And choosing someone strategically who can bring others to the conversation, who can provide influence, in uh, groups that you might not have that much influence in because there are some groups who we don't. Um, that's a really a key consideration when you're choosing your, your first follower. Keep, this is my favorite. Keep in mind the smartest person in the room is in the room. I heard that at a conference one time. I'm like, yes, that's it. This is, I don't have all the answers. Our, uh, um, nobody on our leadership team has all of the answers. We need to pull in, we need to ask those tough questions. We need to party with the outliers, right? We need to engage in those tough conversations because uh, that's the only way we're really gonna get, be able to bring this to scale is to consider all of the margins. Um, and invite and embrace others' ideas for partnership. So <laughs> probably it's not gonna look like the dream team, you know, like the superhero team you might have imagined. It might look a little different, but it's gonna be much richer than probably you could have imagined if you invite and embrace other ideas for partnership. If I had gone back from the, um, the conference at ATIA and heard that comment, like, I don't think we should workshop this, and I would have gone, no, I'm gonna workshop it anyways, it would have fell flat on its face. I needed that input and the lens and the vision of others in my, at the ISD and um, in my group to be able to help build something that worked for, uh, worked for everyone. If you're supporting teacher growth, Extending the, grade of, the reach of great teachers and really coaching the thinking, not the doing. Supporting them on how to think through making their next move rather than telling them what their next move should be. That has been a really important um, piece for us. Going beyond UDL as a checklist, supporting deep understanding. So again, that time for reflection. I would definitely echo that. We need to provide time for reflection, self-assessment, and goal setting. This sounds familiar, right? This is all part of the framework, yes. So that's important for adults too. And opportunities for personalized coaching and peer-to-peer -peer support. I heard somebody over here talking earlier and we we're having those conversations about the, it's so much richer when you have opportunities to engage in dialogue with somebody else who is doing what you're doing, who is in kind of your context, right? When we did our dinner and dialogue sessions over and over and over, the most important 
important pieces. We're not one of us as a consultant standing up there talking to somebody about this. It was the conversations they had around their table um, with other teachers and bringing, bringing back examples and questions and having dialogue. Honor all voices so, and welcome feedback along the way. So opportunities to provide feedback about the learning experiences is really important and honor the teacher voice, giving them opportunities to share ideas, to improve that learning and, and implementation. Because um, if you don't do that, you're going to miss probably some of the richness and opportunities that you can provide to teachers. They have fantastic ideas about how to make this work for other teachers. Um, and that's it. And then dream big. Enjoy the ride. Okay. Thanks.